and good uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure and a privilege to be here. Um, we've got quite a comprehensive set of slides. And I'm really going to go into some of the background to DC because whilst I know it and Tony knows it, it won't be too technical. It's really the historical content because I think people don't quite realise, particularly if you're not electrification biased, that DC is fundamentally electric railways that even up until recent years, not that long ago, um, DC traction drives were still present on AC trains as well. And it's often the train that has driven the development of electrification rather than electrification sparks and volts, et cetera, itself. So I'll run through the slides and um, they're fairly light, but I hope it gives you a good flavour of what we're going to talk about. And it's useful to get some of this background because Tony and I have stitched it into uh, the PWI course on DC uh, electrification that we already present. So that's myself, um, Bob. I'm also an honorary professor at UCL. And that's how I really got into the academic world. That was from uh, my stint in Atkins uh, towards the latter part of my career. And Tony and I have developed um, various courses within UCL on not just electrification, but that's included in the whole of uh, whole remit of uh, railways per se. And we had a couple of modules going on that. And that was really rewarding. Uh, they've run their course now um, due to COVID and various other reasons. So I'm still an honorary professor there, but I just do ad hoc lectures. And it was through our UCL connections with people like Gary Keener that we were in we were invited by PDWI to put our proposals together for this electrification course, which Tony will discuss a little bit later on. But why do we want the DC electrification course? Um, it's really interesting that PWI is seeing itself as a, as a harmonious and a wider uh, training with trainer within the rail industry itself. And so some of these other skill sets are useful to not just the core discipline engineers, but also to associated and supporting and enabling disciplines as well. But the industry continues to need skill engineers, specialists to meet the sustainability system delivery ch challenges of the future. This is a, a problem that's been going on for many years. I'm sure in many disciplines you have the same problem. A real issue, I think, is the loss of DC electrification skill base, not just because it's not wanted, it's become dispersed or a lot of it has been decommissioned. When I go back and think about the Southern Railway and the large electrification group that I learned with, uh, many of these very clever engineers have now, through age, uh, been de decommissioned and whatever. So also by privatisation, rightly or wrongly, we also have a consequential loss of empirical knowledge as well. And I, it's not just railways, it also applies to people like the nuclear industry as well. A lot of people don't realise it's not just volts and amps and conductor rails, but elect DC electrification requires a diverse and integrated range of skill sets both high voltage, and I'll touch on that towards the end, that's the AC high voltage and pure DC power, not forgetting the ETE, that's electric track equipment and its interface with the track uh, structure itself. Also, due to the press and various other sources, the UK industry has been given the impression that DC electrification conductor rail systems, particularly third rail top contact, are limited now and not viable. Not the case. Um, within the UK, we operate one of the world's largest conductor rail DC railway network in the world, and it's an essential component now for the sustainable future. So the PWI's response is to include DC third and fourth rail electrification course into its uh, development portfolio. Why DC? So why did we end up with DC? DC trains have been used widely in the UK rail network since the turn of the last century. Initially, often they were locomotive hauled, something like Waterloo City, uh, not Waterloo and City, but South London and various others were actually loco hauled originally. Even the Central Line Underground was originally loco hauled, but that led to the development of the electric multiple unit. And actually, the basic contact set has not changed over the years, and both locos and EMUs will still use that basic same technology of a continuous or near continuous contact system. 
and which is always located somehow either in the air or at sleeper level on the rail route. It must, what also is interesting and fascinating, DC electrification is rather complicated in its development because the technology that drove it or it used was emerging electrical, electrical theory that, uh, that came around from science uh, during the latter part of the 19th century and into the early part of the 20th century. Also, what should be recognised and why things changed in the 30s was that the, the railway electrification programmes were fairly isolated for a lot of, lot of areas, but actually it also required the development of a national electricity generation and transmission network, the thing we call the grid today. But also interesting, there was this battle of currents raging at the end of the, you know, around the 1900s between AC and DC, between Tesla and Edison. And many of you may have seen those pictures of them of, of Edison electrocuting an elephant to prove that how dangerous AC was. But my, so most of the early promoters of railway electrification were only focused predominantly on their own railway needs. And they were often using direct power from local areas, say up in Tyne and Weir. A lot of the docks had DC capacity from power stations. So some of the early experimental railways used that. Or indeed, they built their own rail power stations themselves, which is something London Southwestern Railway did at Dernster Road. And similarly, Met did at Nees and, and then we've got to Lots Road and others. A lot of the practices were copied from other pioneering railways around the world and it based around streetcar technology. And so a lot of the tr stuff trans transitioned over from America, which is why on London Underground we have things like the terminology of cars and trucks and stuff like that. Obviously, in a deep tube tunnel or underground, it makes sense to electrify rather than using steam. However, a lot of the railways electrification series all stem from information, or so from the from the electric streetcars, but also in South London was stimulated by the conversion of the electric to electric of the London and County Council owned horse tramway network. So in talking about electrification, we need to go back very quickly to look at the train. There were some key ingredients, and I'll just pump up my pointer, if I may. Up until about not, in 1937, Galvani was the first sort of galvanic driven electric uh, train, which was demolished by the workers. They broke it up because they despised it. Uh, then we had obviously Siemens, who in Berlin did his exhibition with his demonstration of electric train. But the key ingredients were getting from streetcars initially was getting the traction ratio right between the drive motor and the actual drive itself and a three or four to one became the right gearing and that remained constant then throughout most of the DC train uh, life. The other major development was the series wound motor. They tried compound but series wound, we won't go into the details of it, is an ideal machine for traction purposes as a very good torque characteristic. And it was Westinghouse, being an entrepreneur, saw the advantages of the nose hung DC series wound motor, and they developed this machine that sits nicely in the bogey of the vehicle, whether it's a streetcar or a train. And that became the fundamental um, arrangement for trains right up until sort of after the Second World War. The other factor by lift technology came along by Sprague was. Uh, train control units or multiple units and that's the next ingredient where you can now control trains through relays as opposed to um, you know direct shunt and um, direct resistance etc and you could then motor other parts of the train so this basic technology carried on right away into the 50s until they came along with the AC supplies on some of the trains for um, the alternators to provide EPB braking, et cetera, and cam controllers. And the major, next major stage was solid state drives uh, in the sort of eight, 1980s, which I sort of first got involved with, with pre-chopper testing and the development of the power transistors. And so today we're in a world now where we are really getting the advantages of transistors and other types of electronic devices where we can generate 
AC for a for traction motors. And so now the prime motive force, as it were, the main prime motive power can come from various sources and we're still now using the same type of train traction drive. There were some other key ingredients. I'll just go through very quickly. Up in the later part, up to the latter part of the 1800s, we had the standard the traditional gal galvanic type devices and early batteries. But by about 1900s, the die was set. We had conductor rails, which was simple to use. Power stations, we talked about Dernster Road, Neeson. But most of the DC power came from converting a low frequency AC from the power stations into DC through rotary converters which required these rather large cathedral substations, which is why in the inner London area on the early electrifications, you find these rather large, what we call cathedral substations. In the sort of mid twenties to thirties, we along with the Southern Railway came along and they particularly Southern had a big program of electrification and through various um, technology and financial aid from government, they started reducing the 30s, the first longer distance electrification programs based around remote substations. And this is a classic AC or high voltage raft and an AC or substation, which you would see on Brighton Line, Portsmouth, Reading, and these earlier longer distance routes. By the 50s, after the war, the development of mercury arc rectifiers, and they're the key to it, because means you can, don't need the rotary converters. And this is a glass bulbed heuritic rectifier, but there were other still tank versions. And that led to the change of frequency programs in London in the 1950s, Kent Coast, electrifications, et cetera. And lastly, in the late 60s, the Bournemouth line. Most of these followed a very similar de developed uh, application of the technology. Uh, the difference with Bournemouth line, they tended to use, well, they did use solid state, early solid state rectifiers as opposed to mercury arcs. Then we have a short a period where not a lot happened other than consolidating the existing network with refurbishment of track breakers, is what that image shows there. The conversion over of mercury arc rectifiers to DC di you know, diodes, et cetera. And there was a big program of oil fill cable renewers, which I was extensively involved in in the early 80s, where we were taking out the earlier 1930s solid cables and replacing with oil filled. Now the die and the clocks moved on and we're now taking oil filled out to replace by other types of cables. And also in this period, we went into lots of resigling schemes with MAS type signaling, where we rather needed to produce high voltage to low voltage uprated supplies for signaling. Today, with the developments we made on the refurbishment programs, we're now into an era from Bournemouth, Weymouth, East Grinstead, et cetera, electrifications to uh, containerized type substations, which are good and bad. There are cases for either uh, that or conventionally built. Upgraded switchgear, more track, you know, solid, solid state traction rectifiers and again higher low voltage AC supplies. A lot of this technology and the ease of modulization was came about by the use of XLPE cables for high voltage, which are plastic cables rather than the traditional paper, lead or aluminium you know, paper, etc. And also jointing techniques down to plug and socket type joints uh, rather than the compound filled cable boxes of earlier days. And again, root materials become lighter, leading on to other components like polymer pots, uh, by um, metal or uh, composited conductor out of aluminium and stainless steel, allowing us to get greater flexibility of distances between DC substations. Track isolators now introduced quite widely now to remove the need for or the reliance on traditional hook switches, and also you can see the image there better guard boarding in depots, et cetera. So that's where we are today. But if we can now put it into more context, the future of DC electrification within the UK third has been widely discussed in many circles, and it's been, at times been discounted as a system for further expansion due to several reasons. Safety issues, and many are familiar with the OOR uh, policy decision in 2012 regarding no more third rail top contact unless special case can be made and safety validation. Um, 
I can come on back to this point later. System capability, top speed to third route and sustained growth on certain core DC electrified main lines and the system inefficiencies and energy requirements leakage. So there was lots of bad press and lots of negative feeling, particularly about the top contact. London Underground, fourth round, DLR seemed to be a bit more scot free from this. So this has limited uh, choices into doing more DC electrification, particularly on our main line surface routes, such as those in the south, those infill schemes that we know so well that we'd like to do. Um, but they're not all bad news. So we come back to some of these points. But putting again in context, Network Rail is responsible for the largest third rail electrified network in the world. It's even on their overseas division on the Isle of Wight. Network also, Rail also operates third rail on the Mersey Rail system. And there were 30 million passengers in the Wirral pre-COVID. Nearly half of Network Rail's 20,000 miles of railway network is now electrified. And 30% of that 20,000 miles is electrified routes using third rail top contact DC. Third rail DC electrification moves significant numbers of people and facilitates rail journeys for many millions a year. Now it's 7 million in a year through Charing Cross. A typical weekday in 2017, around 148,000 people travel through Waterloo, majority of which were brought into London Waterloo through DC traction systems. And on sections, at Waterloo, they record 24 12 car trains traveling through one mainline section in a peak hour. So, some of the arguments about, oh, it's the capacity, et cetera, aren't necessarily true. We're not to forget the Tyne and Weir Metro, that's a 1500 volt DC with overhead line, but the same principles to third rail, and our friends, the Clockwork Orange, the Glasgow subway as well. They also run a, a 600 volt conductor rail uh, system there. There's some of lists there you can look at your leisure if you look at the notes, but there's some of the light rails. Don't forget light rails, which are still new and developing hopefully in the UK. They still use a 750 volt overhead line, but it's still 750 volt DC system, principally the same as the third rail. London Transport which in fact TFL is the largest electrical energy consumer within London. They have 420 kilometres of track electrified with fourth rail. Sections of London Overground are where dual voltage trains operate. There's Dockland Knights Rail, there's 20 kilometres of track electrified with the third rail bottom contact in this context. So it's a later evolution of conductor rails and made a lot of sense. Unfortunately, we're quitting to the top, top contact. Croydon Tramlink is one of those light rail system, but that is 750 volt overhead, and that runs through streets as you are probably familiar with. So basically, there's two looking at two really uh, types of uh, system. There's the third and the fourth rail conductor. Most of you will know that the positive conductor on the third rail system with negative return via running rails, or I say with tying and weir and uh, light rail systems, they use an overhead line for the positive and uh, the running rail return. The unique one obviously is London Underground with the fourth rail, which was there for specific reasons attributed to London Underground regarding obviously iron tube linings, et cetera, and not wishing to, or wishing to reduce stray current. For those who may not be um, up to speed with it, the standard track configuration we have on third rail, this is you with uh, impedance bonds. And we have the rectifier putting the positive out and the return to the negative back to the rectifier is via the running rails. Uh, similarly, the same arrangement applies, but in this case, this illustration is showing without act with axle counters. And so that also now starts to eliminate a high level of bonding, et cetera, and impedance bonds and whatever, as we don't need to segregate track circuits. London Underground, uh, again, um, is fourth rail. The interesting fact is the DC is also switched or has circuit breakers on it. So there are two intertripping circuit breaker panels, which provide a similar uh, voltage. However, they split the voltage with re reference to earth slightly differently. 
uh, also in London Underground, they can put bleed resistors on so they can actually measure the leakage to earth and monitor it. And so to reduce and to sort out any problems about a stray current or whatever. So that specifically is unique for London Underground. For most, most people, the most know this, but we have the running rails here with the negative uh, return via the axle brush from the traction system. And also it picks up from the uh, positive on the outer side of the running rails there at 750 volts nominally. Uh, the early days it was 600, um, but in the London area, we went up to 660 uh, because it was co-running with London Underground. And latterly, we've now raised with Kent Coast starting and Bournemouth line, we've now raised generally up to 750 volts. In areas such as um, the Rhine round uh, East Wimbledon, etc., where both network rail or both mainline as well as London Underground use, as well as up on the uh, out of Euston and places like that, where the overground runs with London Underground, we have a pseudo uh, fourth rail system. We just bond the ne negative to uh, the one of the running rails, and that gives us the plus 750, so the tube trains can still run on it effectively. London Underground is slightly unique. Some of its tube network is uh, 630 volts, depending on the age of rolling stock, and they split it a minus 210 and a plus 420 volts. And as they have moved now up to 750 volts with minus 250 and plus 500. These are a typical arrangement for those. Again, I would suggest if you anyone wants to have a look, you can give you other copies of these or you can look, pick up the uh, pack itself. But we imagine the two substations are totally shown two types. They're roughly three miles apart, rule of thumb. And that is the track feeding arrangements where we have a section which is double fed each side from each substation via a high speed circuit breaker, et cetera. And the negatives return back to each of the re respective rectifiers. By inclusion of a thing many of you were heard about the TP Hutton network rail, there's no traction supply there. It is just a leveling bar, as it were, or a topping up bar or a paralleling bar, which is why it's termed that. And what that can tend to do, if we look at this illustration here, this little, uh, it's not to scale, but between A's, which B, which shows a conventional without a TP hut, we normally have a voltage characteristic like that, where the voltage through resistance of the track tends to drop. Uh, with a TP hut, it actually raises it somewhat in the middle so we can get better performance from our power supplies, etc., and also increase the distance between substations. Similarly, composites conductor can also allow certain extensions between substations uh, because of it reducing volt drop. Many of you see lots of these other tin boxes or substations, like cathedrals and, bat and bungalow type substations beside the track, but most are very similar. This is the range of equipment that will be in a normal traction DC substation from the DC switchboard in the third, I'm going to show you the one here for third rail, which provides us the protection for the track. And then we have the high voltage AC there for switching the high voltage network and the traction rectifier to provide the DC. So most of those are about every three miles apart. Some will have more than one rectifier. Um, some may have multiples. If you go to places like Waterloo, um, areas like that, there's many more rectifiers up to about four, four usually. Uh, but the DC network southeast, it's worth having a quick look how it's evolved. As I said before, we had the conflicts with the electrified trams, where they London County Council electrified the horse trams. This put commercial pressure on London Southwestern and the London Brighton South Coast, as well as South Eastern. And the solutions that came out, London Brighton went for an AC option at 6,700 volts, 25 hertz. And London Southwestern went to the DC standard 600 volts third rail approach. Interestingly, because of the rivalry over the years between um, South Eastern Railway, London, Chatham and Dover, and eventually saw sense and had a management committee for South Eastern Chatham, 
around the turn of the century, they were always more cash struck, but they were even looking at electrification up and prior to 23 using a 1500 volt system based on their own power station, although that was forced to agree to take from a, the area or the generating boards. Um, but it never really got off the ground other than outline design because of the grouping in 1923 into the Southern. Most of the Southern network we see today, I think we can now attribute to two great guys. One is Sir Herbert Ashkin Walker, who was the general manager of the Southern Railway eventually after they amalgamated and also the London and South Western Railway. He pioneered or brought in or say sponsored but championed the use of electrification to solve a lot of their commercial issues. And a guy called Raworth um, from 1923. And there's a very good book I put a cup in there by Peter Steer about the history of Raw Alfred Raworth's uh, electrified railway. And they really set the standard for most DC, same as you would get on Mersey Rail, etc. that's run more or less even up to days with some changes. Um, and that really was going ahead until about the start of the war. So why DC the way we see it and why is it still here now? It was London Southwestern had the power or had the, the strength to actually impose the third rail system on the whole of the Southern Railways rather than just the London and the Southwestern. It used early technology and experience from overseas using streetcar technology and the experience of the other railroads. Being, you know, being focused on the bottom line, it was less complex than the bright line overhead line system. Conductor rail located within an existing track lay layouts to the main. Had a more minimum impact on signalling, because don't forget that was the early days of track circuitry. But what was also important was the early days of the existing sting rolling stock, which was often uh, suburban stuff, which wasn't that old, could be easily converted to multiple units. And in the 1930s, we had the Railways Agreement Act of 35, which financed or helped finance uh, a lot of the expansion on the Brighton Line, where Brighton Line came in and the, and the electrification to Bournemouth, etc. Kent was also on the list, and that was in Rawworth's report in 1943, along with Hastings and some of the other subsidiary lines, which are now closed by Beeching. But a lot of what happened after the war was very much based on what Southern would have done anyway. Most important thing, there's a less stringent attitude on health and safety. Uh, but the two important factors, I think, is that the communities in the southeast of England, where we are, had a close proximity to each other and with the coast was very attractive. And so it really had a metro characteristic. And so the longer mainline routes to the southwest were longer haul, and even the southern recognised that, and it wasn't their intention to electrify greatly into the southwest, other than perhaps to Salisbury. <clears throat> so the very nature of our geography in the area we live is natural progression into electrification and the benefits that accrued. If you go to the Metropolitan Railway, in a way they're the other way around, they drove the railway to develop the areas. Um, so it's quite an interesting fact. There's a list of all the various um, electrification activities that take, took place after the war, <laughs> up until the power supply upgrade. Most of us will be familiar with many of those. And again, I'll leave these on the slide so you can have a look yourself or you probably are familiar with most of them anyway. I thought I'd show that image very quickly, which is, you can't read it, but that shows you the size of the high voltage network on the Southern, on Network Rail Southern. That's predominantly 33,000 volts. There is some 11 and 22 kV on certain less you know, used lines or lighter used lines, such as Bournemouth, Weymouth, uh, et cetera. But in fact, the, the, the network rail in the South is effectively a DNO, and there's a similar network, 11 k network, on Mersey Rail. So it's a significant high voltage network, which I don't think is often appreciated uh, within railway circles. Going back to the top contact issues, there's a very good article, and I put the link here to Modern Railways, who argue uh, 
that they weren't measuring apples with apples when they were talking about the fatalities and weighted industries calculations to put the embargo or the temporary embargo on DC. So that's worth a right read through that article. And also in that article, some very interesting comments around how the labour workforce was disbanded or been whittled away. Safety system enhancements such as low voltage actuators for activating track isolators in areas which are awkward or you can't put the traditional track circuit switch in uh, to remove the hook switch or the need for staff to go track side, securing access to electrified lines, particularly for trespass, and business and operational necessities in the rail industry's German to carbon neutrality, the DC electrification is a key element. Regarding system capacity and, and capability of third rail, we are doing power, there are power supply reinforcements, additional grid points of taking in to help, development of high speed conductor rail lamps, uh, ramps. There's 24, I mentioned already the 12 cars in one section in going to London or to Lou. And the DC top conductor rail, whilst it's about 100 mile an hour, uh, it can be extended by high speed conductor rail lamps a bit more, but the service pattern required for the business isn't long, long, non stop. Most, most stopping areas or community centres or business centres are fairly close together within the south. And so the need to drive up beyond 100, 110, 120 is fairly limited, I would suggest. Energy requirements, every system has its weaknesses, losses, including AC. The advancing polymer conductor rail instrument insulators and the improved composite conductor rail helps reduce uh, energy loss. The development of using solar, wind and other renewables, that's ongoing. Network rail are experimenting or trying a lot of this and undertaking commercial deals for totally renewable power supplies, et cetera. And also energy storage is a possibility on one train in steam branches, et cetera, where perhaps uh, batteries or whatever aren't viable. Okay, I'd like to now um, turn over to Tony, who will go through the actual PWI course, which under underpinned uh, all this DC electrification and has actually been informed quite a lot by the uh, earlier discussions that I was went through. So, Tony, if you're there, you'd like to I, yes. carry on. Yeah, thank you, Bob. Thank you very much for that. That was very interesting uh, content. Um, so a question, why has the PWI responded with a DC electrification course? Well, I think as Bob has touched on, uh, the rail industry continues to need uh, skilled engineers and specialists uh, to continue at developing the system into the future. A lot of the electrification skill base uh, has become lost over over time um, and with the consequential loss of that uh, knowledge uh, that they had between them. Um, DC electrification, I think it's uh, it's very easy for people to think of DC electrification solely in terms of the third or fourth rail, which is it is the most obvious thing that you see. But actually, uh, as hopefully you've appreciated from what Bob has said earlier on, uh, it does cover a, a, a large range of skill sets, um, a, HV, AC power, DC power. ETE, but also there's a high degree of, of um, uh, interdiscipline uh, integration that's needed. Uh, and that often is forgotten as well. Many people within the uh, UK rail industry uh, can be led to believe that DC electrification conduct rail systems, uh, in particular top contact, are limited and no longer viable. It really isn't the case. Um, third rail systems do have a very um, valid future um, in, in this country, but also I've, I've, I think it's worth appreciating that uh, third rail systems continue um, to be developed and uh, con and also continue to be built uh, elsewhere in the world, mostly metro systems, but it, it's far from a uh, uh, old technology. Uh, if you could change 
slide, please, Bob. Yeah, I've frozen. Try again. Yeah, there you go. Sorry. OK, yeah. yeah. Um, so just to give you an overview of uh, what the PWI course um, aims to give, um, the, the the main aim is to is to give delegates an understanding of the notification principles, their application uh, and safe practices. Um, it allows delegates to gain third and fourth row notification system knowledge. Uh, and, and that covers from the bulk supply of the energy right through its transmission, distribution, um, through substation and and a conversion to DC through to e ETE at the third rail, fourth rail, through the train and uh, traction return. Um, also gives an understanding of the legislation, standards and codes, uh, and also, also looks at the uh, key stakeholders and some of the interfaces that are involved with DC um, electrification. The, the um, level of learning outcome achieved is assessed through a uh, set scenario, which I'll come on to in a little more, um, more detail later on. So next slide, please, Bob. OK, so just go through the um, main learning outcomes. Uh, there are six key outcomes here. First one is um, to be able to describe in principle DC electrification as applied within the UK, including mainline rail, metros and tram systems. Uh, second is to be able to describe and understand the principal DC rail electrification systems, their interface with rail vehicles, civil structures, earthworks, rail operations, uh, and I think it also ought to include track there separately, uh, and identify integration needs together with um, specialist areas like AC DC changeover and interoperability. Um, third one is to give an appreciation of asset management requirements for DC electrification. Uh, the next one is an appreciation of, of, of UK legislation and standards, uh, and also how um, insurance and compliance with those is achieved. An understanding of uh, DC electrification issues related to, to environmental issues, sustainability and safety. Uh, and Finally, um, there is an assessment um, on, on, on an optimised integrated solution, which I'll come to again a bit later on. So the assessment itself is an open book written assessment. Um, and um, it, it's, uh, it, it, it is based on uh, the knowledge that the delegates will have gained through the four days uh, of the course. Um, and you can see the pass criteria at the bottom there. Next slide, please, Bob. OK, and then going into a little more detail of some of the topics covered. Some of these uh, have been mentioned by Bob already. So that there's an element of uh, the historical context of DC electrification, um, how they've evolved in, into the systems that we know today. Uh, overview of the electric train, how that has, has um, developed and how the electric train interfaces with the electrification system. Next slide, please. Um, talk about the bulk supply of the energy to the railway transmission and uh, distribution, uh, as you would have seen from one of the earlier slides that Bob uh, showed. Uh, for example, the network rail um, uh, HV system is extensive. Um, it's it's um, 
also matched, I guess, to a lesser extent by the London Underground system and, and also doctrines like railway, for example, all have similar, albeit smaller, um, systems. Um, uh, there's also an element of looking at the non-traction loads that are supplied uh, from the substations. Um, look at the DC traction substation in more detail. So, so we look at um, the main equipment that's inside the substation, typically at what its functionality is. Uh, and uh, um, for example, it's quite a bit of uh, focus on, on transformer rectifiers and high-speed circuit breakers. Next slide, please, Bob. DC track feeding principles. So um, the, the course looks at the principles of safe track feeding and traction negative return, both for third and fourth rail systems. Um, the course looks at various components that make the, the track feeding circuit, sectionalization, isolation, means of isolation, and how you would um, select points of isolation. Um, ETE, um, we're fortunate to be joined by um, Zoe Wernhold from uh, London Underground, who's a track engineer. And uh, Zoe gave a very comprehensive overview of LU's fourth rail system. Um, of course, looked at both third and fourth rail ETE uh, systems. Looked at uh, the integration of ETE with the track design. Um, Track design can, um, in, in particular in complex areas, can can make electrification in terms of trains not being gapped, either very simple to solve or, or if you have a poor track design, it can really complicate matters significantly. Um, so that was looked at in some detail. Next slide, please, Paul. Um, the course also looked at AC DC system changeovers. So that's where you go from a DC system uh, to an AC overhead system. There are quite a few um, different AC DC systems uh, in use in the southeast of the UK. I suppose the one that most people think of is Thameslink, but there are others as well. Um, and there are a number of different ways of, of achieving that interface. Uh, earthing and bonding and other electrical interfaces. Um, earthing and bonding, which is, is related to safety very much significantly. So, um, and um, a, a, a a focus on on uh, touch potentials and controlling touch potentials, stray current and mitigation of stray current. Next slide, please, Bob. We we were also very fortunate on the course. We had a guest speaker, um, Nigel Wheeler. Some of you may know Nigel um, from um, Network Rail. Nigel spent time discussing uh, the, the future of DC electrification um, uh, and, and the third rail system, uh, the importance of it. And he also explored several innovations and developments that have been undertaken to enhance the safety of of uh, third rail systems into the future. Uh, the course also looked at DC asset management and uh, bringing the system into use. Uh, that's, that is another key element that is easy to be overlooked, um, but uh, it, it, it is nonetheless very um, topical and um, one of the key elements as well. Next slide, please, Bob. Safety, sustainability, and integration. Um, 
safety obviously is a very key um, um, issue and and um, the, in, the integration of the system safety in terms of of um, um, the overall system um, and the inclusion with an integrated solution for the railway. Next slide, please, Bob. Right. Um, the assessment um, that the delegates were given at the end of the course um, was uh, an extension of the DC electrified Chesington branch to um, to go to Chesington World of Adventures. And if we can go to the next slide. Yeah. Um, so the overview brief, um, based on the 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 uh, experience of um, Bob and I in terms of um, delivering teaching to um, UCL, the the assessment was not a traditional PWI exam, um, but it was. Uh, um, through coursework that the delegates were free to, to um, begin working on um, at the end of each day if they wanted to or at the end of the course. Um, so the main aspect uh, of, of, of the course was that the delegates took the role of Network Rail electrification consultant for the design installation and bringing into use um, of the extension of the third rail electrification of, of the Chesington branch. Uh, this entails a single line electrified extension uh, and the delegates were invited to submit um, their proposal at the end of the course uh, together with their supporting information. Uh, each submission was subsequently technically assessed and, mar uh, and marked um, with PWA making formal awards and learning credits. Next slide, please, Bob. So this is an extract of the quail map showing the existing electrified um, system as far as Chesington South and then the dotted red line showing the um, extension that is planned to go to Jasmine World of Adventures. We'll go to the next slide, please. Well, uh, this slide um, highlights some of the um, distances to allow the delegates to integrate their solution with the existing system. And then um, to the next slide, please. And uh, this slide shows the, the existing electrification arrangement, um, um, shows the track feeding arrangement, um, and shows the non-electrified extension to Chesney World of Adventures. And, and it was on this um, that the delegates then had to um, produce their proposed solution. Next slide, please, Bob. Okay. Um, the assessment criteria is uh, listed here. I'm, I'm not going to go through this in in any detail, but you uh, are free to do so. I, I have been conscious of time. Next slide, please. So each of the delegates was given a uh, assessment workbook to work on, which they um, submitted at the end of the course. Um, once again, because of time, I won't go up through in detail, but you're free to read this at your leisure. Next, please, Bob. Uh, so our reflections and closing comments. Um, so the first course was in November. Um, 27 delegates um, were at the course. Uh, of those, 
Um, 23 took the assessment at the end. All of them passed, um, some with um, merit and others with distinction. Um, I guess with reflection, there are some changes that we would want to make uh, for the next course, but overall, the course of it was very well received. Feedback has been has been very positive, uh, and uh, I think um, it is a success. Thank you. I think that may be the last slide, Bob. Is it? Yes, it certainly is. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Well, what's uh, an informative uh, presentation, gents? Thank you very much. Uh, what struck me was. Um, how long third stroke fourth rail has actually been used on the railway um and the obvious southern region springs to mind but as you say there's lu dlr mersey rail there's a number of different locations that actually employ uh, third and fourth rail and as you said i think it was 30 percent of twenty thousand route miles yeah so yeah, interesting like that, yeah yeah so good um does anyone have any questions for either bob or tony i think uh, did Phil have his hand up? Yeah, Phil, you got a question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks very much, uh, Rob and Tony. Uh, it was a great presentation. Um, yeah, it's um, well, I've got two two questions actually. Um, first of all, back in the late 80s, I, I worked on the P way side at London Bridge, and um, Blackheath Tunnel was a particular problem with stray currents. And to the extent whereby you could you could stoop down and break away the foot of the rail with your hands, it was it's crumbling. It was crumbling so much. Um, I haven't heard too much about stray currents being a problem on the DC railway in the southern since then. Um, I guess they've they've been you know scattered around. But is 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 there a reason why that might be the case? Is it still an ongoing problem? These stray currents, or, or have we got to grips with it somehow over the years? Um, I've been out of maintenance for a long time, by the way, so I've kind of I'm probably a little bit um, out of touch with it. But yeah, I just wondered what what your views on it were. Really, that's my first question. Yeah, I, um, I would say stray current is is still an issue. It's perhaps not um, such a significant issue apart from, um, in specific areas where it tends to be worse and that could be down to, um, track condition, maybe sometimes, uh, also ground conditions. Uh, but there's a whole host of reasons why you might get stray current in some areas and not in others. Um, I think the improvements in uh, traction bonding, uh, and also improvements in, um, Insulation of rails from um, base plates and sleepers have probably helped to a large extent um, to control straight current, but it never goes away on a DC system unless you've got a full frail type yeah. arrangement. It's yeah, it, yeah it's um, yeah. now you come to speak about that. It was um, it was wooden track, you know, it was timber sleepers with base plates, and no, there was no insulation between the rail and the base plate and you get you got a lot of build up uh in the mm. tunnel um yeah. which uh, allowed i guess allowed the um return current to stray uh into the system underneath the rail so uh so yeah, yeah I, I guess now over the years you know so much concrete sleepers mm. with pads and nylons uh yeah. now around yeah. that you probably don't get that yeah. sort of problem but it also yeah. what doesn't help um uh, Certainly in the past was more of an issue, I guess, with um, 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 brake blocks rather than disc brakes on trains. Um, you used to get a lot of contamination. Um, yeah, that's a good point. Um, yeah. If you've got ballast heaped up around the running rails, that. that yeah. Also, um, yeah, I certainly remember that, you know, yeah. the rail being covered in uh, brake dust. And, um, yeah and residue from that the, the other question i had was around the um the the dcac changeover mm. um because i've worked on a couple of projects in the design stages um on new railways or new connections so you've got 
sort of situation like Ashford, mm. where the changeover happens stationary in the platform, I believe. Yeah. Uh, and then you've got other examples like, uh, I think, on the West London line, around just north of Shepherd's Bush. I think it, the changeover is on the run. And I know when we were doing air track, which was DC yeah. railway into an AC overhead yeah. at Heathrow, yeah. um, there was a discussion about what, what was the best thing to do, whether it was, is it better to do it on the run or to do it in a stationary situation? And it kind of logically, it seems it's better to do it when you're in a platform stationary, but there are some advantages to doing it on the run, I guess. So I, I just wondered if there was any anything from an electrification point of view that you could say whether one is better than the other? Uh, no, I mean, really, the first uh, system that uh, had a changeover that was on the move was really um, the introduction of, of Eurostar and Dirt Class 92 services um, through Don's Moor um, on the opening of, of the Channel Tunnel. And obviously, there was a need to develop a changeover system that didn't require the trains to stop for obvious reasons. Now, one of the one of the key constraints around that is that you need to have a lot of space uh, in, in terms of distance for the changeover um, section um, because uh, Obviously, the train's moving, so you're using up distance while you're changing over. So that was, I suppose, relatively straightforward to achieve uh, in the um, um, Don's Moor area, I guess, because it was new and there was just enough space. Elsewhere, um, most of the changeovers are done statically. Um, simply the space constraints more than anything it I, I i guess it's also easier to control the changeover when a train is standing still um even thames link for example the actual changeover ac to dc or vice versa it it is actually done um statically but there is a changeover dc to dc section that controls the interface between the ac and dc um through the uh, through city thames link but that's not actually the, the traction changeover itself but elsewhere it's it's always done statically yeah. well, the other thing is yeah the other thing though tony of course is the fact that where it's done on the move say in west london line or whatever you've got plain line yeah when you yeah. said you go anywhere it's complex isn't mm. it? You stop the train because you shorten the distance, you have to mitigate it. Mm. Uh, uh, and the other thing I think is interesting, which is Nigel Wheeler was on about, which is worth, if you can, ask for getting him to come along and go into more detail, is the concept of putting traction batteries, not driving batteries for distance, but short period traction batteries on existing rolling stock just to go through gaps so you don't actually have to do you can run on a battery oh, okay. in a short mm. section. Uh, yeah. And they're also looking at that, I understand, is it Tolworth, I think, where they're looking at the energising the conductor rails in the station area, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. You, so they were going to switch them on. But one of the concepts is that you could take conductor rails out of a particularly busy station areas mm -hmm. and, and if you had it, but it's very limited life on the, of the battery. So it's a whole palette of ideas. Um, mm -hmm. OK. Yeah, great. OK, thanks, guys. Yeah, cheers. OK, so we've had a few comments about a uh, great presentation. Uh, Dan said he was on the course and really enjoyed it. So that's all good stuff uh, there. I can't see any other questions. So um, if anyone hasn't got any more questions, um, what I would ask is, um, Phil, could you do the vote of thanks for me, please? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, th well thanks, guys. Um, it's it's really informative. It's uh, it's you know, it's not often we've had a uh, a DC electrification um, presentation to the PWI, and uh, it's it's been there's a there's a lot to talk about, um, lots of different variations. And, you know, if you, you travel around the world, you see, again, lots more variations on third rail mm. 
uh, in metro systems, um, which make you start asking questions about our own here in the UK. Mm. And uh, yeah, so it's it's really really good to um, to be able to uh, to understand the history of, of um, how the third rail came to be in the southern region. I thought also one of the factors was was about the um, the clearances, uh, the you know the, the such uh, restricted clearances in the southern region with lots of bridges not allowing for overhead line. Mm. I don't know whether that was a factor, but um, uh, it was just one of the things I thought about there. But um, but anyway, great presentation, guys. Thank you very much for spending the time to put the slides together and. Um, and to come and talk to us about this uh, this uh, very interesting subject. So uh, thanks, guys. Cheers. Yeah. It's our pleasure. Yeah. Thank, thank you very thank much. You. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank. Thank you, Phil. Uh, thank you, Bob. Thank you, Tony. Uh, I just wanted to add uh, as a gentle reminder uh, our meeting in February. Uh, Jonathan Bray of this parish, PWI, uh, is giving his presentation on the evolution of the Docklands Light Railway, and I dare say there will be some third rail involved with that so if you're able to join us for that that would be great if not enjoy uh, the rest of the day and i'll no doubt speak to you all very soon thanks a lot oh, thank, thank you very you. much cheers, cheers. Bye. Bye. thanks bye bye then bye bye